Thank you very much, Sylvan. <clears throat> uh, uh, I can only agree with uh, all of your words. Uh, also, I, uh, it's not only Eli, you, you were right, because uh, Ricky also played the piano and that at some point, fairly late in life, uh, he started playing the clarinet, you remember, and he was ca carrying a, around his, his clarinet all the time. I don't think that he ever got to the uh, level he wanted to uh, be at, but, but, but definitely music was a very important part of his life too. Uh, so are there any mathematical questions? I have the advantage of having said something so vaguely that nobody can criticize what I said. <coughs> nobody can question it anyway. Yeah, you hope so, at least. <laughs> so uh, now, so I, I, I like to thank uh, Mark Strauss for setting up this um, uh, meeting. In fact, uh, he was. Uh, when it became clear that um, the meeting we originally planned at the Simons Institute got uh, sort of shifted, shifted and shifted, uh, it was Mark's idea that at least uh, we should do something online. I also uh, would like to thank uh, the uh, co-editors of uh, the DCG, Ken Clarkson and Chaba Tote for um, helping to set up this event. And uh, the geometry seminars at NYU, Boris Aronov, Joe Malkevich uh, for sharing this, this event. Also now, I think that on the CUNY side, Adam Sheffer and Radosh Radojic are also part of it. And the seminar is uh, sort of um, every other week is on one place, every other week uh, on the other place, which is uh, hypothetical, of course, because uh, <laughs> if it is a Zoom seminar, then uh, uh, it doesn't make a big difference. And uh, the event was also shared by the Combinatorics uh, uh, seminar at uh, CUNY. Uh, so here I'd like to mention Sandra Kingen. So um, uh, it, let me also say that Russ Kaflisch, the director of Quran, was eager for us to have this and to have the opportunity for us to give this tribute here. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, very nice. I hope that there will be a live event sometime, uh, maybe next year when we will hardly remember uh, COVID anymore. Then I guess that the floor is open. So whoever wants to share any pictures, mathematics, memories, whatever, uh, is more than welcome. Many Showing thanks to, to the organizers and speakers for, for doing this. I pulled uh, volume one, number one of discrete and computational geometry off my shelf. And uh, uh, happily, some of the people who were editors of the original version of this were able to join us today. Lou Valera, Marjorie Seneschal, but sadly, uh, a lot of very distinguished geometers who Ricky and Eli worked with and created the editor original editorial board of discrete and computational geometry have passed away. Uh, Donald Coxeter, Henry Crapo, Ron Graham, Paul Erdes, Bronco Grunbaum, Vic Klee, uh, uh, Giancarlo Rota, Jacob Schwartz, uh, Bill Thurston, Godfrey Toussaint. So those were some of the, on the cover, those were the editorial board. And if you turn to the back of the first issue, the very first article in DCG was written by uh, Noga Alon and Daniel Kleitman, covering the square by small perimeter rectangles. And the last of the series of articles in the first issue were, uh, by Elmo Welzel, and there was this guy named Janos Pach, 
who wrote an article called Covering the Plane with Convex Polygons. Uh, and several of the people who uh, attended today's session, Richard Stanley, uh, Janos, uh, some other people were, were early contributors. So uh, I was very lucky to, uh, there was a meeting on convexity uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. And I uh, met at a social event, I read, met Erwin uh, Lutvak and Ricky Pollock there. Uh, and uh, to some extent, the genesis of the geometry seminar was my observation that it didn't make sense to go to Norman, Oklahoma for geometers in the New York area to get together. Uh, and then later, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, meet Eli through uh, when the seminar started up uh, and he would come quite regularly. Uh, um, so um, it was very nice that we were able to have this event honoring them today. Uh, I miss them both as uh, Sylvan commented. Thanks a lot, Joe for your remarks. So, so I'll, uh, I'll go next. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm Rafe Wenger. I was, um, I was not a student of Ricky's, um, but I did work with him and Eli um, extensively on transversal theory. And uh, yeah, so I, I just wanna make some comments about really the two of them as, as a team. Um, in many ways, they were kind of opposite. I mean, um, Ricky was um, very gregarious, outgoing, kind of carefree. Um, a little bit. I mean, he, he once told me the way to cross the street is just not to look, because then they assume you're an idiot. This is in New York City. They assume you're an idiot, and then they won't hit you. Whereas if you if you make any eye contact or anything like that, then then you're a target. Um, and Eli, in some sense, was pretty much the exact opposite. He was very careful, studious, and he, he was shy. Um, and you know, it's part of people do <laughs> think connected more with Ricky because Ricky was the outgoing one of the of the of the, of the two of them. Um, but they were really very much a team. I think partially um, because they had this opposite, they worked, you know, the, they were able to create the journal, you know, whereas Ricky wouldn't pay attention to the details, Eli would. Um, that certainly is important when you have a journal um, in the beginning. Um, what really did bring, the, one of the things actually that brought them together wasn't mathematics, although they were mathematics students, I think it was music, actually, when they got back together, they actually met at a concert and, and it was Eli who sort of um, said he restarted the the, um, the relationship and said, "Hey, let's work on something in um, you know together in mathematics, something in geometry." I and mean, Eli had been an algebraic geometer, which is you know, pretty uh, pretty abstract, but he wanted to work on something a little bit more concrete and doable. Um, the other thing about them was, um, you know, people know Eli was the son of Yiddishus, the the person who the editor of the Forward, the Jewish Forward, um, and the Yiddishists were very much secularists. Um, Ricky was very much a son of a communist, and um, he marched in the um, communist parades for was it the Rosenbergs, um, and those are sort of two different streams in in Jewish history of, of the 1920s to 1960s. If you ask why I fit into that, I was a Zionist. So if you take Yiddishist, communist, and Zionist, those, those are three um, very different ways of approaching uh, the Jewish problem from 1920 to 1960. Um, so it was, it was lots of fun to talk to them um, and be with them. Um, just a couple of things I remember. Um, so, I mean, they were, because they were different, it was kind of things that they wouldn't agree upon. So for instance, Eli never liked to take the subway. Um, he just didn't like the enclosed place. And Ricky thought that taking the bus upstairs to, to, to um, City College was just a waste of time, it just too, too, took too long. So they have these perennial fights about that. Um, also, I mean, Ricky once invited us um, to his place in the country for uh, a week to meet and Eli. Um, and then there were fights about, Ricky felt um, you should take off your shoes when you're in a country house. And Eli being sort of a, a good Jewish, older Jewish man, thought you never take off your shoes. It's kind of a sign of mourning, I think. I, I'm not sure why, but. Um, and, and the other thing was that, um, Ricky actually that weekend had left over some chicken, um, which he was gonna serve us some chicken stew from the, from the weekend. And then he realized Eli's vegetarian, I keep kosher. Neither of us was touching you know, the chicken. Um, so is that difference? Um, and I would say that, um, I mean, they both really 
um, very, very generous. I think people do know, you know, could recognize how, how um, generous Ricky was. Um, he gave me a key to his apartment at NYU. I don't know how many other people he gave keys to that apartment with, but I think, it, you know, um, where you could just stay there if, if it wasn't empty. Um, he was always going to sort of share. Um, Eli also, whenever I'd go in, you know, sort of invite me to things, um, take me out to the restaurants and he'd let me, you know, take me to a kosher restaurant with some vegetarian. He once took me and his wife, Josie, to this kosher, which it did kosher meat and vegetarian meat. And he said, you can, you know, I get vegetarian, but you can order the meat. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't politically aware or really thinking. And I saw veal on the menu. I didn't really know, know what veal was, but it looked interesting. So I ordered it. And of course, veal is baby calves. It's really not a, it's the worst thing you can order. Um, in terms of vegetarian, but he didn't bat an eyelash. Um, Josie sort of at the end kind of said something a little bit and I realized, oh, and I think that's the last time I ever had veal because it really is the wrong thing to have. Um, and I guess that's all my memories of them. Um, and I think of them fondly and it's nice to see all these people who sort of I interacted with, you know, in the times when I was um, going, to NYU, going to NYU and visiting them. Take care guys. Thanks a lot, Rafe. Let me add to what Rafe said that when we used to go to restaurants for the seminar, Eli wouldn't would would ask to make sure that the soup had no meat stock, and Ricky was a very proud anti meat person, uh, anti vegetarian. <laughs> he would give away to the people who were eating with him his vegetables. He didn't want the vegetables. <laughs> uh, he only wanted the meat, the real thing. <laughs> so maybe I. Uh share if I can find it. I shared this uh, picture of... Um... While you're looking, just let me add how nice it was that Ricky and Eli were always so encouraging to the young people. And now that all of us aren't so young anymore, we, I, we try to continue that tradition. Well, of course. So here is, here is what I refer to, the period of Ricky when he was carrying his clarinet. Uh, actually, uh, it was um, Eli's daughter's uh, bat mitzvah, where there was a, a Kletzmer, Kletzmer concert, and, and that's when Ricky fell in love with the clarinet. And for years and years, he tried kind of uh, uh, with more or less success. So here is a picture, I think, that when there was a special year organized by, special semester maybe organized by Mika uh, in Israel, uh, Herbert Edelsbrunner on the right. This is, uh, this is a very strange picture, I don't know. Ricky on the train, but it seems that he's logged, logged in. I'm not quite sure. Uh, how it happened. This is the smoking picture. And uh, I, I don't know. So do you recognize if it is Columbia or Queens College or City College? Where, where is it? I'm not sure. Maybe Columbia. Uh, maybe Columbia. And uh, here you see behind Ricky that uh, shy man, shy boy, uh, is um, Gunther Ziegler, who is uh, today uh, president of the Freie Universität Berlin. This is Micha, maybe with uh, Leo Gibas speaking with Leo Gibas. And this is uh, one of the conferences, I think, that at Snowbird, Eli is uh, chairing a session. And indeed, he was a wonderful organizer. So he paid attention to, uh, to, to, to every, every detail. So there were, of course, permanent discussions and uh, between, between Ricky and Eli about about anything and whatever one said, the other one definitely opposed it. And I think that this is, I mean, I don't know much about it, but I think that this is also the 
in the best Jewish tradition. And this was perhaps the basis of their successful collaboration that, uh, that uh, one put forward something and the other one uh, uh, tried to prove that it was complete nonsense. And uh, it worked very well. In fact, they, they, they managed to upset each other in, in record time, like uh, in, in, in an uh, old uh, marriage. Yes, which to some extent it was. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, some, some of the pictures. I, I wanted to say I was very grateful to, to, to Ricky and that he, uh, he helped me a lot and encouraged me in the computational geometry community and got me involved with DCG. Um, and uh, I really appreciated his optimism. <laughs> I thought he was always positive and uh, uh, he was a great encouragement and, and he built this community and I think they, I mean, I appreciate all the things that happened because this um, community was built and the various conferences and keeping everybody together. I just think it was a great thing. Thank you, Jeff, for your comment. Any other? Ricky started off, Jeff, as a number theorist, maybe as you know, uh, rather than as a geometer. And I actually uh, knew his uh, thesis advisor, Harold Shapiro, <laughs> many, many years before I met Ricky. Uh, and uh, he eventually, uh, I think part of what made him uh, uh, such a talented geometer, especially when he and Eli started working together, was that both of them had connections outside of uh, discrete geometry, uh, that they brought tools and ideas that uh, helped them solve all sorts of interesting questions. Uh, let me mention that uh, Harold Shapiro's son just sent me today a photograph of Harold lecturing uh, and one can recognize on the blackboard, he's written some theorems in number theory and he's attributing them to Pollock, uh, one can see, actually. Yeah, that's nice. <clears throat> By the way, uh, let me say one thing more about uh, Eli's background, which is uh, I know from discussions with Eli that his father was the lifelong associate of a famous character named Isaac Steinberg. And <clears throat> I could fill up the evening with stories about this Isaac Steinberg, but uh, uh, let me say that Isaac Steinberg was a member of Lenin's original cabinet uh, when he formed the revolution, the second revolution, the communist revolution. But I'll just tell one story about what that point of view was and the difference. When Steinberg finally figured out, Steinberg was supposed to be minister of justice in the Bolshevik government uh, as uh, a left social revolutionary. He wasn't a Bolshevik, but it was supposed to be a coalition. Anyway, uh, he only lasted about a month and then fled for his life to America. But, uh, but at one point he told Lenin in a cabinet meeting, uh, he was supposed to be minister of justice. I said, he told Lenin, if that's your real policy, you don't need a minister of justice. <laughs> you don't need a minister of revolutionary justice. You just need a minister of revolutionary executions. And Lenin replied, that's true, that's true, but we can't call it that. <laughs> Janosch, I, I, just, I just want to let you know I still have that clarinet. <laughs> I'll show you, you next time you're in New York. <laughs> okay. And are you working on it? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think I'd have any more success. Thank you. Well, all I think for... that you, you can get to Ricky's level. <laughs> you really work hard enough. Well, I'll try. <laughs> he would have loved today. <laughs> Thanks for showing up, Lori. Um, my pleasure. And thank you all so much for, for organizing this. It's just wonderful to see all the faces that I remember from the past. And uh, it's, it's been great. Thank you. He's dearly missed. Yeah. And thank you, Janusz and Boris and the, all the organizers.
Thank you very much. Okay, so it seems that this is the end of it, and uh, thank thank you all for staying so long, and uh, yeah, and uh, I hope that there will be another big meeting at the Simons Institute in 2023. But the details have to be worked out. Thank you, Janusz. Thanks, Janusz. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank this you. Is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.